said, I'm going to be talking about variable fonts. And what I want to do is show you a few areas where I think variable fonts will play an important role in the future of web typography and design, but also for things like performance, accessibility, and usability as well. So one thing that I like to make clear is that I'm a developer, not a designer, uh, but I do have a huge appreciation for design. And I enjoy experimenting with CSS uh, to push the boundaries of what we think is possible uh, with design on the web. So one thing that I started doing about a year and a half ago was making text effects. And the point of these text effects was so I could make real, editable, selectable, searchable uh, text, which is accessible via a screen reader, and replace things like images and video and canvas with just text and CSS. So during my experiments, I started playing with variable fonts, and it became clear to me really quickly that variable fonts present us with some unique opportunities that standard fonts just have never been able to give us before. So before I dive in, I wanted to get browser support out of the way so that you're not sitting there thinking, well, is this going to work in my browsers? And it's actually really good. The major browsers all support variable fonts. You do need a high Sierra or above on Mac for it to work in browsers like Firefox. But given this level of support, I don't think there's any reason why we can't start using variable fonts now, or at least experimenting with them. So on that, the best way that I can describe a variable font to you is that they're one font file that acts like multiple fonts. So where you might have had 10 different font weights, for example, is in separate files, all this data now exists in one. And the way that this is created is the font designer in the font itself creates a style axis. So for example, a weight axis. And where you would have maybe a 400, a 900, and a 700 weight, that all exists along that axis. But the benefit of a variable font, and what I think makes them really, really special, is that you don't just have those individual master weights. You have access to all of the values in between that, because the axes can be interpolated. So this axis goes from 100 to 900 in font weight. We can access 101, 102, 103, 104, and so on and so forth, all the way up to 900. And because the axis is interpolated, this means that we can animate between the values and start to create really smooth transitions. And we're not just limited to a single axis. A variable font can contain many different axes doing many different things. And as you can see in the image, the interpolation doesn't just apply to a single axis at a time, it applies to all of the combinations as well. So you can have a wide, bold font or a narrow, thin font. And because of the way that these fonts are made with the interpolation, they typically result in smaller file sizes. So if we were to use uh, Source Sans Variable by Adobe as an example, uh, this has a weight range of 200 to 900. These are some of the fonts, the weights that you can have. In total, this comes to about 394 kilobytes. That seems like a lot, but Source Sans has a lot of characters ligatures in, so it's quite a comprehensive font. Now, if we were to compare this to the standard font weights that we have with, with Source Sans in its standard format, they're about 234 kilobytes per file. With just these weights, so none of the extras in between that the variable font has, that's about 1,856 kilobytes worth of fonts. It's kind of a lot. Of course, that assumes that all of those fonts exist, which they don't. So if we get rid of the ones that don't exist, it's 924 kilobytes. That's nearly three times the size of the variable font, and you don't have as much flexibility or any of the additional weights that you had in the variable version. Even if you just went for two versions of this font, if you just had the bold and the regular, which is pretty common, the variable font is still a smaller file size than using just two of these. So not only do variable fonts reduce the overall file size, but we now only have one network request. And I know that we have things like HTTP2, and that reduces the network overhead already. But this is still a major technical advantage. 
especially when you consider we can combine this with technologies like better font compression for WAF2, for example. That's going to reduce the file size further. And if we combine these technologies, the bandwidth and the performance issues, they start to become less of a problem for us. And as variable fonts become more widely supported across all the different operating systems, we can start to look at ways that we can use them, like in our font stack as our fallback fonts. So right now, when we swap between fonts on the web, between our custom and our fallback, we might end up with this point where the layout shifts as we switch between the different size fonts. And it's kind of a bit gross. And right now, we can modify things like line height and letter spacing, and we can try and match our system fonts to our custom fonts to try and reduce that layout shifting. But with a variable font, we can modify the font itself. We can change things like X height, width, weight, or other axes to match that font itself even closer than we can now. This will start to create that smooth transition between the fonts. That's going to mean less flash of unstyled text and less redraw. And we might even get to a point where fonts never cause invisible content and never cause the layout to shift again, which would be an incredible performance benefit uh, for our fonts in the future. And I really hope that operating systems start making some good variable fonts. Now, the way that we use variable fonts in our CSS is pretty much the same that we use fonts now. For the most part, we set up the fonts using font face. Pretty much the same. The main change is how we define variations for descriptors like font weight, font stretch, and font style. So in this example, I'm going to use font weight. Normally, if we have a light version and a bold version, we'll set up two different font face blocks, one for bold, one for light. But with variable fonts, we don't need to do that. We set up one, we set our font weight property, and then we define a range of values. So 200 to 700, for example. Then, over in our CSS, we can just reference our fonts exactly the way that we normally would. We have our font family and then the font weight property. But the benefit here is we can pick any number that we want within that range, like 658 if we want, or you can pick 200 or 400 like you normally would. Now, this is really awesome for things like font weight. That's a known axis. That's something that we already have a CSS property for. But for anything that's custom, we need to use a new property. And that property is called font variation settings. And what this does is it enables us to define as many named and custom axes as we need. So a named axis in a variable font is something like weight, width, slant, and optical sizing. Anything outside of that, that's a custom axis. So here, I'm defining weight. It's referenced with a four-character code of WGHT, and then it has an associated value. And then we separate that with a comma, and we can define another axis. The second one is the custom axis called inline. That's referenced with the characters INLI. That's determined by the font designer. And the key difference here is that named axes are in lowercase and custom axes are in uppercase. Now, if you need to support older browsers, we can make use of CSS feature detection to check whether or not variable fonts are supported. And if they are, we can load in the styles that we need for our font. And then we just use our standard fonts as our fallback. Now, I know that this means that they're not going to look the same, but that's OK. We don't have to have everything looking the same in all the browsers all the time. CSS feature detection makes this really easy for us. So at this point, if we're not limited to some of those technical problems, if we've solved things like performance and fallbacks, we can start to shift our focus with typography. We no longer need to trade off design for performance. And creativity can drive our choices instead of technical limitations. And we can start to make things like this. Now, for me, this is a really exciting example of what variable fonts can do on the web. This is just a variable font. It's called DecoVarts by David Berlow with some CSS and a keyframe animation. It's editable, it's selectable, it's searchable, it's accessible via a screen reader, 
And it's an excellent demonstration of the capabilities and the opportunities that variable font provide us. In particular, I think it demonstrates that fluid animation that I mentioned earlier. It's only because variable fonts have this interpolated range of values that we can create these kind of fluid variations. And we can achieve these animations by using techniques that we're already familiar with, like CSS animations, uh, transitions, or even hooking into JavaScript events like scroll position, viewport size, or the sensor APIs. So if we were to look at this grass example and make that with CSS, as I mentioned, I use keyframe animations. I use two axes. This one is inline. This one is skeleton worm. I call this nobbles. When you join them together, there was a bit of an interpolation error in the font, and it created little points. And obviously, I thought that looked like leaves and thought, well, I'll make a cool effect. So I set up a keyframe animation, just a few lines of CSS. We put in our font variation settings. I set inline and skeleton worm to 1,000. And then at 50% keyframe, I reset skeleton worm to zero. Now, what's important here is that much like with transforms, you need to specify every axis in the variation settings when you're doing keyframe animations. Otherwise, you're only going to end up with the one axis that you're defining. So the last step is adding the keyframe animation onto our element. It's called grow. It goes for four seconds. It's got linear easing, and it runs infinitely. And that's how you create the effect. Now, I'm using other things like background clip and text shadows to make it look all fancy, but the effect itself, that's mainly the font and a little bit of CSS. We don't need reams of code in order to get something like this to work. We just need a few lines of CSS and a really awesome font. And there are a lot of really awesome fonts that you can use right now. Uh, you can do writing with text. You can do hover and interaction effects, weird stuff with blend modes. This is Decovar again. Decovar is an amazing variable font. It has so many options. Something weird like this one, maybe an icon font. Not convinced icon fonts are going to make a comeback, but I like the example. It's actually the cat emoji. This one's Decovar again, and it's one of my favorites. Uh, what I love about this one is that it really shows how different variable fonts are to other fonts in that as the text disappears, the text shadow disappears with it as well. This does crash the browser, though. Um, <laughs> creates a nice little heater for you as well. Now, this is a new one I made just last week. It uses Chi by Ono Type Co, and it like oozes. Blood would have been an obvious choice here, but I went for slime. So it's not just that these are really beautiful or cool effects. What they demonstrate is that as developers, we can now control the font itself. It's kind of like having an API into the font that we can manipulate. And that means that variable fonts allow typography on the web to adapt to the flexible nature of our screens, environments, and devices. So we can start to design our typography to adjust to things like screen width. That might allow us to tweak the weight, the optical size, or other axes to make things more readable on larger or smaller screens, whether that might be a Apple Watch or a projector or a laptop or a phone. We can start to modify things to be more legible, more readable, depending on the environment that they're in. We can take advantage of other events, like the scroll position. This is using Chi as well. It's a great font. We can detect things with the sensor API. Yes, my phone is cracked. We can change the font size based on the distance and change the hierarchy and meaning of the text, depending on how close or far somebody is. We can even have the font respond to audio input or the sound of your voice. 
Now, with the growing use of devices like the Google Home and Alexa, voice recognition is becoming more and more prevalent. Now, something like this could be really useful for things like conversational UIs in visually representing tone or intent of a person's input. And being able to recognize the environments that our users are in allows us to move towards better font legibility and readability as well. We can create more sufficient contrast based on the user's environment or their current experience. And there's currently a bunch of work being done with media queries in CSS, which will aim to give us more control over our designs based on environments, light contrast, and color schemes. So we can improve our legibility of our text depending on these environments. Now, one really great one that you can have a play with now, it's available on Mac OS in Safari's technical preview, is dark mode, which you may have heard about. So you can use the media query prefers color scheme, you can set it to dark, and you can change the way that your font is displayed based on that mode. Now, I've added a transition in here so that it'll change between the two modes. I made a dumb example. When it's dark, it oozes. When it's light, it doesn't ooze, because it's dark mode. Did you get it? Yeah. OK, so that, that is a bit dumb, right? But more practically, we can modify the contrast and the styles, and we can make the text and the, our websites more accessible and more legible. And as CSS develops and as JavaScript develops, we'll have more access to different environmental and system features that will allow us to take advantage of our users' unique circumstances. It's only because variable fonts give us more control over these elements that we can fine tune the font characteristics and maximize that accessibility and readability and legibility. And while these examples might seem trivial, they're demonstrations of the possibilities because this is a level of control over our fonts that we've not really had before. And when we're not limited by these technical considerations around performance, Creativity can start to determine our choices, and our content can help drive that creativity. Because in the end, we gain much more flexibility in our designs. Designs which would have previously been impossible or a heavy burden on performance are now completely within our grasps. The tone and the intent of our words can be more effectively represented, and we don't have to worry about how many fonts we're loading in the website. We can embrace the learnings and the growth of print design, but also benefit from the flexibility and the interaction on the web. And because technology like CSS is always improving, we now have more opportunities than ever to combine, create, and present content on the web in more creative, more meaningful, and more purposeful ways. And we can do that in a performant and accessible manner. We need to forget about those perceived limitations because this is your opportunity to figure out how we can use this technology to create better experiences for our users. Right now, in my opinion, there has never been a better time to be a developer or a designer on the web. And variable fonts, they open up doors that have never existed to us before. At the very least, with variable fonts, we can improve the performance of our websites. But at, at the very best, we can make more usable, more accessible, and more meaningful content as well. Thank you.